Okay, I got the recording started. Ooh, better uh, watch what I say. Hmm, yes, so for the record, this meeting is being recorded. If somebody uh, misses out on parts of this presentation, it, the recording will be posted ultimately to the museum's website. That's ncmaritimemuseumsbofort.com. There is a drop down menu that says museums at museum at home. At that point, you can take a look at not only this presentation, but also the form, um, other virtual presentations that have gone on over the past few months through um, from various museum staff members, including others by Keith himself. Um, I wanna welcome everybody here to um, this lecture. We're very excited to have it for World Turtle Day. I just wanna point out a couple housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions or comments, we ask that you enter it into the chat feature either through Facebook, you can just put it into the comments underneath the Facebook um, video, or you can put it into the chat feature here on our um, Zoom link on, on our Zoom chat, and then we will bring them to the attention of Keith at the appropriate time so that he can address those questions and comments. Also, I do wanna mention the fact that we do have another presentation coming up uh, next week on May 28th, our Maritime Histor History Curator, David Bennett, will be giving a lecture, um, Fun on the Water, the Early Days of Coastal Tourism in North Carolina. So that's a new one for us, which is very exciting too. Um, but I've got a couple last minute people coming in. So I'm kind of trying to kill time, let them get in. Um, okay, like I'm I gonna said, leave. Hmm? I'm, I'm going to leave for 30 seconds. Okay. I want to get one thing. <laughs> it's going to have some fun props. So we have a couple more people that are slowly joining. So I just want to give their technology a chance to catch up. But in case you missed it, um, we do have a presentation coming up next week. Uh, by David Bennett, our Maritime Curator of History, and he will be discussing fun on the water, the early days of coastal tourism in North Carolina. Our lecture series at the Maritime Museum will then pause for the summer, which is a, con we do that every year. Um, and then, so our next lectures will not be until August. Uh, definitely keep an eye on our calendar as we come up on the next round of lectures, which are key to be pretty exciting. And then, oh, I lead it off actually with by hook or by crook. Then, um, as I said earlier, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them either in the chat feature here on the Zoom page or on our Facebook page. We are monitoring both and we will bring them to the attention of Keith so that he can address them. Uh, otherwise, Keith, if you're ready to go, I'm gonna hand the floor off to you. Okay, thanks, Christine. Welcome, whoever's watching. Yes, uh, my name's Keith and I love questions, so uh, let them fly and I think Christine will help moderate them. I may stop uh, once or twice in the presentation. If I power through this presentation, I think it would be about 30 or 35 minutes long and happy World Turtle Day. Sea turtles in North Carolina, biology and conservation. This is a, an exciting season if you're interested in sea turtles and I'll, I'll introduce you to that um, momentarily. These are uh, primarily four topics I'll be addressing very briefly as they relate to North Carolina's five species of sea turtles that we have documented. You may recognize this, it's a satellite image, I believe. And at the bottom of the screen is the southern tip of South Core Banks, Cape Lookout, and that that box I'm gonna expand to show you the southern tip of Cape Lookout, the east end of Shackleford Banks there, the lighthouse is there just to kind of orient you. This is Harker's Island. And this mile and a half or two mile stretch of east facing beach at Cape Lookout is one of the highest densities of um, sea turtle nesting which begins um, almost as I speak uh, this month. It has already begun, in fact. So that, that is a sea turtle nesting beach there at Cape Lookout. This poster represents all of the turtles, including sea turtles in North Carolina. The sea turtles are pretty easy to find just because they have a red flag with 
old white print that says they are threatened or endangered. And all of the North Carolina sea turtles are either threatened or endangered um, currently. And we put together a list in case you want to see the, the uh, taxonomic relationships between turtles. The uh, five species of sea turtles are on top, the five, the top five turtles. And uh, as you can see in the right column, they are all threatened or endangered. And I'll introduce you briefly to each one of those. To give you an idea of the relative sizes relative to a human on the left, these are the five species. I'll be covering today. It's the one in the middle, the loggerhead that we see most often nesting or stranded or swimming. Uh, the smallest and most endangered is Kemp's Ridley, but I'm gonna go through these uh, as we proceed. Leatherbacks are the easiest to identify. I believe Christine was on my boat when we saw this one. Uh, a couple of things I wanna highlight, they're huge. They have these raised ridges that are very distinct on the top of their shells. Uh, and this is the time of year we see leatherbacks. They also nest here. They also have this pink spot, some sort of gland. I forget its perfect purpose, possibly sensory, but that enables us to identify individuals as the, um, we use photo ID to try to uh, recite individual leatherback turtles we see around here. So that's a leatherback. Um, loggerhead. If a sea turtle comes to the surface and you see any yellow or orange, uh, it's a loggerhead. Uh, it's the one we see most often around here. This one has some mud on its face. And we see that, especially this time of year, they come to the surface after presumably groveling in the sediment for their prey items, which includes shellfish and crabs. Hawksbill. I think every time I've ever seen a sea turtle associated with a floating object, as this one is, that is a log in the lower left. Um, it's a hawksbill sea turtle. I am not aware of any nests in North Carolina. In fact, there are very few nests in North America uh, and some hawksbill nesting in the Caribbean, I believe, but um, uh, they tend to be uh, solitary nesters, I believe. And we don't see them often, stranded occasionally. This is a hawksbill I got from Customs in San Diego. If you have a uh, research or education permit, you are able to get things like this from customs and uh, they're very distinct in the super sharp snout, gorgeous shell with the scutes, those little uh, plates that overlap. And this was probably taken from a nesting beach or out of a fishing net and prepared in Mexico to sell to a tourist illegally. And it was attempted to be smuggled across the border and uh, customs allowed me to have this specimen. So the top shell called the carapace and then the belly shell called the plastron. Hope that makes sense. And I'll introduce you to those um, anatomical features a little more. This is a green sea turtle we rescued out of a gill net. In that net were a few dead and dying uh, lots of things, <laughs> but we were able to uh, rescue this green sea turtle. Um, named, I think, not because of their external color, they're not really green, they're sort of gray and cream colored, but uh, as adults, they're primarily vegetarians, and so I think their guts are green, and hence that's how they earned their name. Green sea turtle, uh, they're present this time of year, and they do nest on North Carolina beaches, not as often as loggerheads. And the smallest and the most endangered is the Kemp's Ridley. And I'm kind of excited to tell you that uh, this nesting season, which began earlier this month, the first recorded nest was a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. And I think typically they are daytime nesters. Uh, the only one I've seen was nesting during the day. The other species uh, typically nest at night. So that's a Kemp's Ridley. Uh, swimming right there in Cape Lookout Bite. 
And I just want to pause for a second to see if anyone has any questions or comments, or if you're, if I'm speaking too fast or unclearly, uh, chime in and Christine will alert me. I, well, I haven't heard any seen any questions in the chat yet, but actually Kristen here had a question. Hi, Kristen. You, mention, you say hi. Hi. Um, she, you mentioned <laughs> that Kemp's Ridley was the smallest sea turtle, um, and she thought you meant like the baby size. Or how big is a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle? Oh, thanks for paying attention. I meant um, smallest as an adult. Oh, of course, the hatchlings are smaller. <laughs> um, Kemp's Ridley gets about two feet long. Okay. And oh. the other species get much bigger, but Kemp's Ridley is the smallest as an adult. Yeah. Hatchlings, I don't know if the hatchlings are, uh, I, I suspect they're smaller than other hatchlings, but I don't believe I've ever seen a Kemp's Ridley hatchling. Yeah. But yeah. thanks for the, that big. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Say thank you for the answer. Thank you for the answer. And All right. We'll let you know if any more come up. I All right. Thanks. And Facebook appears to be clear right now. So thank you. Okay. Um, we'll call this the beginning of the sea turtle life cycle. These are mating adults uh, right here in Beaufort Inlet, actually. And we see that this time of year prior to nesting. The male is on top, the female's on the bottom, and they lie at the surface for quite a long time. And as he whispers sweetness into her ears, the male has a claw, and this does not seem like a party, but that claw digs into the flesh of the female just beneath the carapace there. And often when we see a, um, a nesting female early in the season, her shoulder shows evidence of having made it. It's uh, raw and sometimes uh, bloody. So these are mating Loggerhead sea turtles, how do I know? Well, the orange and yellow colors um, pretty much give it away, um, as well as the width of the head, but yeah, loggerheads. And then the females come out to the ocean beaches and lay eggs. And this was the only nest I've ever seen laid during the day I was alone in a boat off of Shackleford and there was a stranded sea turtle on the surf. And I thought, well, I'd go pick it up. And then I maneuvered my boat and the turtle was moving and then the turtle was on the beach. And I thought, oh my, how unusual, a turtle nesting during the day. And I knew that turtles are skittish and they'll abandon their nesting attempt if they get spooked. And there was a bunch of beach walkers with a dog walking toward the turtle. They hadn't seen the turtle yet. So I anchored my boat and dove in and I was gonna tell the beach walkers, please stay away because there's a nesting sea turtle. Uh, but they saw me and they turned around. And I stayed on the beach and I stayed away from the sea turtle until I was sure she had finished laying eggs. What species is it? This is your first quiz. <laughs> the only species that I'm aware of that nests during the day is a Kemp's Ridley and it was a Kemp's Ridley, terrifically exciting to me. I hope this video works. And we're going to give it a minute. This is that mom that I just showed you who came out to nest. She's laid her eggs and now she's using her hind flippers and her body to cover and tamp down the nest, the eggs she had just deposited. Who says turtles can't dance? Oh, I try to advance it. You already saw that. There we go. And uh, she turned around and crawled back to the ocean. So that was fun. And I got great photos and video. I was able to share it with the park. This was on Shackleford Banks and they were able to monitor the nest to confirm that it, the eggs actually hatched. And this time of year, terrific volunteers are walking and riding beaches in North Carolina looking for evidence of a mom sea turtle coming ashore to lay eggs. And so the tracks on the right are her first 
um, approach to the dune, but she got spooked or didn't like something about that area. So she crawled over to the left, dug a nest there, deposited eggs and returned to the ocean. Uh, that whole process, uh, it varies, but it, it, you know, hour and a half to two hours is, is um, what nesting takes, even longer in some cases. But that's what people are looking for this time of year. And this is a, a sea turtle actually depositing eggs. So her head's up there, you can't see it, but with, there's her front flippers and she, with all four flippers, she throws sand out of the way. And then with her hind flippers, she excavates an egg chamber into which she deposited uh, about 115 eggs in the cases of loggerheads around here. There's a close up. This one is tagged. That teaches us a lot about nesting interval and nesting locations. And they squirt something on the eggs that I've been told has some sort of scent masking or antibiotic property, but that's what you're seeing here. So our hind flippers are off to the left and there the, that's her tail and the eggs are being deposited into the sand. I think I took this photo at uh, Hammock Beach State Park. It just shows uh, what an egg chamber looks like that the mom sea turtle excavates with her hind flippers, like an like, upside down light bulb and shows the eggs about the size of ping pong balls inside the nest. Occasionally we have to transplant nests because they are laid too close to the water or where there's too much human disturbance. And so uh, this team is taking the eggs out one by one, putting them in the bucket and we would go and uh, transplant them to a, um, an area where they had a better chance of uh, actually incubating and hatching. Keith, before you move too much further, we have two questions that have come up. Great, so, yes. Um, first, there's the question of, was the Kemp's Ridley nest they referred to, was it barricaded, ultimately? It was caged, not barricaded. And I think you mean keeping vehicles away from it. And it was on Shackleford, so the only vehicles on Shackleford are the park vehicles, and they were all aware of it. But it was caged to prevent raccoon predation. I hope that answers the question. Um, and then we also had the question, any idea how many times a logger nest, a loggerhead will nest during the season? I've heard of as many as five times. Uh, that's, that's a question really talented people are trying to answer what's typical. Um, but two or three times is not unusual in a season. Interestingly, um, there's conflicting data whether she always returns to the same nesting beach or not to lay her eggs. And uh, well, actually it's, it's, it's clear that it's not always the same nesting beach. It could be a different island or, or it could be further away within the same season. And there's some question about um, whether she returns to her native beach, the beach from which she was hatched to lay her eggs. And uh, more research needs to be done on that. So um, I think five's a record that I've heard of. I know someone probably heard of more, and, uh, but two or three is not unusual. I hope that answers the question. Great question, thanks. I've got two more, hold on. All They're right, bring them. As you're, so um, from Facebook, we have, well, one comment from Casey saying, my daughter loves turtles and is watching this. Turtles need all the lovers they can get. And I'm about to tell you why, but thanks. And we have a question from Carol. How long does egg laying season last? Oh, I'll show you that graphically. Um, starting now and into uh, as late as late August, rare as would a nest be laid in September, uh, but there's a lot of variation. Okay. So now certainly into August. And last question, I should have mentioned the first two questions came from Helen Aitken and this one does as well. Um, any idea if the female will mate more than one time during the season? It is thought presumed that she mates once and stores sperm to fertilize um, consecutive clutches of eggs. 
hope that makes sense. I hope I, I think I answered. Yeah, so she mates once. Of course, it's hard to confirm um, you know, if it's uh, if she gets inseminated in various mating attempts, but she can store sperm. Sounds great. Okay. okay. I think you've covered everything. So. All right. I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> um, I, and I just want to mention something about predators and raccoons. Uh, some seasons will destroy every nest if they aren't protected. And uh, my experience with nest management is with Cape Lookout National Seashore. They do a terrific job putting cages over the nest to keep raccoons away and uh, a few other methods as well. And, I, um, and I've heard uh, coyotes are becoming an increasing problem, particularly on South Core banks as far as nest predation. They will destroy a nest, kill every egg, eat every egg. And um, if, if they aren't caged soon after they are laid, the whole nest could be a failure, which is what we're trying to avoid. This is how we mark nests at Cape Lookout. This is the cage I'm talking about. Um, wire mesh and PVC pipes marking um, a few feet either side of the egg chamber. And that successfully keeps uh, raccoons, the main predators, out of the eggs. So that, that seems to work well. And that's typically uh, just at the base of the dune, but not in the vegetation is a great location for a nest. And Helen's good question about the nesting season. So bear with me, this is the only data slide I have, but this is just one year, 2018. And this is the, um, for Cape Lookout National Seashore, this is the number of nests each day in blue. And then as we move into August, the number of hatchings or emergences each day through September. After September, it's pretty cool and hatching often is not successful. Occasionally there are nests that have not hatched as late as November. We figure they're goners. Sometimes we uh, excavate the eggs and inventory the nest or routinely actually. So I hope that makes sense. So nesting on the left side is, is starting right now and it will peak in the hot days of July and then tail off and while nesting is still happening in July, hatching of those main nests are beginning. And then a hatch, hatching peaks in uh, late August, early September. So that's graphic representation of uh, the answer to Helen's question. Just before emergence, and this is after about two moons, 56, 58 days, it's a bit of variation there, depending on when the last nest was laid. Um, but the incubation period of about two moons, almost two months, uh, there is a depression in the sand. And that's what you see here. I have swept the sand over that depression. That depression tells me that these hatchlings are going to emerge tonight or tomorrow night or the night after, and they're moving around, pipping out of their shells. And typically, kind of soon after sunset, they will emerge from the nest. And I've swept over it so that I can see pretty clearly the footprints of hatchlings. So if I go back to that nest, I can see if any hatchlings have emerged. Typically, hatching or most of the hatching of a nest occurs at one time in a you know, one, two hour period but often a few hatchlings will trickle out the day before and more often hatchlings trickle out the, de the evening or two evenings after the, what we consider the mass emergence. I hope that makes sense. The next slide might make it clearer. So that's a hatchling coming out of the water. This is the right eye. If you can see my pointer, that's what's called a pipping tooth, but not actually a tooth that cuts the eggshell, we believe. This is the right front flipper. And this is the head of his brother or sister coming out. Now at this point, they're super sensitive to light and they will go toward light to their doom. I've seen evidence of them crawling into campfires. It's horrible. They crawl to the streets and get run over. They need dark, quiet, peaceful beaches. And so you're wondering, well, why did Keith take this picture then with a flash? 
And I want to assure you that this was the only nest I've ever seen that was emerging during the day. And that's, um, that's why. So that's sunlight, not a flash. And they did crawl to the ocean as evidenced by the next slide. There's one of them crawling. And there's sort of the mass emergence at that time as early in the morning. The nest was up there and we just pretty much followed them and made sure that birds weren't going to eat them on the way and ghost crabs weren't going to kill them. So uh, uh, I feel like it was helpful that we could actually guide them to the water, but we did not want to pick them up or touch them or throw them in the water. Oh, yeah, those are just a couple of dried dead hatchlings from a nest. Often most, most nests, in fact, there are uh, eggs that don't develop and hatchlings that die in the nest. That's what happened here. And those ghost crabs, man, they, I mean, one year we had to just watch them decapitate hatchlings as part of a study. And it broke my heart. And this is a ghost crab um, killing a loggerhead hatchling. And when I saw it, which I saw it tragically often, they would snip the head off and just nibble a little bit on the head, nibble a little bit on the body, and then go kill another. And that was to document ghost crab predation. Um, we weren't so friendly the next year with the ghost crabs. Um, but this one year, we had to watch this. And I mentioned in the nests, there are often some uh, hatchlings that don't develop, and that's an example. So that's an egg from a nest. The nest had emerged, the uh, healthy live hatchlings had pipped out of the shells, crawled to the surface, crawled to the ocean. We had gone into the nest five days after that mass emergence to see the hatch success and to document, uh, well, there's one egg that never developed. And then in the center is um, a hatchling that died apparently as it was pipping out of its shell. So there's a lot of mortality built into the system and this sort of documents that. Some other conservation issues, uh, fishing hooks. So this is a fishing line and this loggerhead died at the end of a hook, at the end of a line on a hook, a very large hook in its mouth. Boat strikes, whenever I see a deep cut in the shell and a series of parallel cuts perpendicular to that deep one, I know that it's an outboard motor, skeg and propeller blades that cut the shell and presumably was the cause of death, as in this turtle. And this one, I sort of framed this with a boat in the background and the Cape Lookout Lighthouse. But this is what I'm talking about, one deep cut, and then a series of one, two, three parallel cuts of the propeller blades hitting it. And uh, I think I'm a boat, good boat driver. I care about sea turtles, and I'm pretty certain I've hit two sea turtles. Uh, if, you, if you're not paying attention, you're not aware of them, uh, power boats and sea turtles don't get along. Entanglement is another cause of death, and this one uh, has been entangled in a monofilament gill net, uh, presumably the cause of death for this one. You can see the net sort of piled up around its left front flipper right there. This is a live turtle I got out of a net and it was very skinny behind the head shouldn't you know you shouldn't you should see fat there I mean it, it just super skinny but it was pretty active and I was able to put this tag on its flipper and release it and many years later I got a report about that tag the turtle was recaptured in another net uh, you know incidental capture to, to fishing and um, it was alive and it had grown. And this is how growth rates of sea turtles are, are discovered, you know, by tagging them and then uh, documenting them when they show up again, either dead or in another net in this case, or on a nesting beach. So that's just a metal tag that I clipped to the trailing edge of the flipper on this loggerhead sea turtle. And I'm gonna pause for a sec to see if anyone wanna chime in with a question or comment. Keith, I've, I've got a, I've got a question. Um, 
there are there are films uh, from World War II of uh, U-boat crews um, killing sea turtles as a food source and bringing them on board U-boats. Um, is there any particular turtle that was preferred as a food source, or did they, just any old turtle would do? Or wow, I don't know. I know they were taken here and presumably loggerheads because that's most of what is seen here. But I'm about to show you historical evidence that would suggest a leatherback was taken um, at the end of this. Hi, nice to see you. <laughs> so I don't know what species and what locations, but presumably Cape Lookout Bite would be an easy place to grab turtles from the water. I mean, this time of year, I often see two or three turtle heads at a time. Yeah, the film, the film was interesting because it didn't look, I mean, it looks as though they were, they, and they were filming this turtle in the water and they, they shoot it and they bring it on board. And I guess my next question was, would that have only have happened off the North Carolina coast or could have happened someplace else? Yeah, my guess is it would have, my guess is it would have happened many places. Um, and I've read that another way of harvesting sea turtles for consumption on ships was to not shoot them or harpoon them, but bring them board alive and store them upside down because they could stay alive for a long time on a ship. And you could have fresh meat longer if that turtle, of course, is dying, dying slowly. But um, I've read that that was, a, that was one reason to bring sea turtles on board. They were just would stay alive and you'd have fresh meat. That Not film is in the National Archives. I'll have to see if I can get a copy of it for you. Okay. It'd be interesting. Yeah, that would be news to me. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we do have another question from Helen. Okay. Um, yeah. She wants to know, uh, what agencies provide the tags for tagging? How are they registered after they are, they are used? And how, how much would a tag cost? Just out of curiosity. Uh, yes, thanks. There's a big variety in tags used. So I'm going to um, summarize this very briefly. NOAA, NOAA Fisheries is where I've gotten my tags. And there's a data sheet uh, that I fill out every time I've tagged one, you know, with the number on the tag, the method of application, the location, the species, and the photos, such as this one, to document the tag. There are uh, these flipper tags, there's also internal tags, much like someone might tag their valuable dog, their internal tags and uh, you would need a scanner to detect it. Uh, and so that's done on nesting beaches for, by people who have scanners or uh, the stranding network of course ha has scanners. So they scan every turtle. There are other tagging methods, which in involves um, attaching a tag on the shell. And it's either a radio tag for short-term monitoring or a satellite tag for long-term, long-distance monitoring. And these tags have an antenna. Again, um, a lot of people fabricate them. I, I think NOAA Fisheries uh, are the keepers of the data, at least in the tags I've handled. Sounds great. Okay. One more question that just yes. came through Facebook. Um, Carol wants to know, she's coming to Emerald Isle in mid-June. Is there a volunteer organization she can connect with to participate in Nest Watch? Okay, uh, I think you said June. Mm -hmm. And my guess is there'll be no nest watching in June because there will be no nests um, that have had enough time to incubate. The North Carolina Aquarium at Pine Knoll Shores does a terrific job. I admire them and am grateful for their great work for, for sea turtles and for people. So if you get in touch with the aquarium, uh, they can give you current information. And if there are any turtle watching or nest watching opportunities, they would have their fingers on the pulse of that uh, locally. Uh, and there are other beaches. Baldhead Island has a really great program as well. But June's a little early for nest watching. Um, the uh, egg laying is happening in June. And I, I, when uh, the questioner mentions egg nest watching, I'm presuming she means sitting by a nest waiting for hatchlings to emerge. There's some predictability there and a lot of good organizations like the aquarium 
um, does try to involve the public in that. That's great. Thank uh, you. This is um, a horrible example of a sea turtle that was wrap, wrapped up in monofilament fishing line and Craig Harms, the veterinarian, had to actually am amputate the front left flipper. And then they did um, endoscopy and also found monofilament fishing line in its digestive system. Uh, so I just show you this to highlight two other conservation issues, um, entanglement we've already discussed, but also ingesting plastic is a um, big problem in North Carolina, and I'm afraid maybe getting worse. So it inspired uh, what we do here and what other states have done very well. I've just copied everything Florida did well, which is uh, put up these uh, receptacles with signs on beaches, docks, and piers where, where people fish and frequent to try to educate people and actually get folks like me and you to take not dispose of fishing line in the ocean or on the beaches and pick up any that we find because it is lethal. And for a live animal to get entangled in this stuff, quite frankly, it's a horrible way to die. So we would like to um, address this conservation issue of a discarded monofilament fishing line. Such as this monofilament net, and I may have watched this leatherback hit the net it was full of energy, way too much energy for me to face safely disentangle it. So I kept an eye on the net and got some volunteers from the shore and said, hey, I'm gonna need help getting this turtle out of the net. And gosh, I got some help. And a bunch of people helped me. We uh, cut the net, brought the turtle and the remaining net ashore, disentangled it. You can tell this is a leatherback, one, because of the tremendous size and two, because of the raised ridges on the carapace. Um, and we were able to release it, uh, tag, measured it, tagged it, and released it, um, uh, presumably healthy. But it was um, a success story, although the turtle might not agree. And there it is, crawling back into the water. Boy, does that give you goosebumps when you think you saved a life. What species? You got this. It's a leatherback. Hatchling, a hatchling. There was a nest at Cape Lookout and I was nest watching by myself waiting for these to hatch, but of course they didn't. And I went to bed around two in the morning and at seven in the morning, I woke up and ran out to the nest to see what happened. And I was depressed to see a, the shoreline lined with satisfied looking gulls. And there was a mass emergence and I saw hatchling tracks end at gull tracks. Gulls ate, as far as I could tell, every hatchling that emerged from that nest and no hatchling tracks, as far as I could tell, made it to the ocean. And I was pretty depressed and was walking around just kicking seaweed and under a piece of seaweed was a live leatherback hatchling. I guess the only one I found and it was the, as far as I could tell, the only survivor. So I kicked the seaweed off of it and there it goes. I hope the video is coming through. <laughs> Maybe the sound's not, but. <laughs> Good luck, turtle. I think you're the only one in your nest who made it. And leatherbacks, oh man, I think typically have plastic in their stomachs. And this was one that stranded uh, several years ago now. It um, died on the beach and in the stomach was a large uh, piece of plastic, that plastic. Ooh, whatever it is, wrapper or bag or something right there. And I just grabbed this off the web. It was uh, happened in Texas. Uh, someone was cleaning their mahi-mahi or dorado or dolphin fish, all different names for the same fish. Fun to catch, delicious to eat. And this one had a bunch of sea turtle hatchlings in its stomach. So yes, these hatchlings and any of them returned to nest 
um, is, is quite astounding. That there are so many obstacles that they face, which is probably, you know, why a mom needs to lay hundreds of eggs every season that she lays, um, because there's a lot of mortality built into that system. And if you enjoy shrimp as much as I do, you probably had shrimp caught by a trawler. And trawlers are responsible for killing a lot of sea turtles. But now in certain areas, at certain times of year, shrimp trawlers are required to have turtle excluder devices in their nets to save sea turtles. And when they work, the boat moving that way catches the turtles and shrimp in this net and something as big as a turtle will hit the bars and get ejected out, but something as small as shrimp will go through the bars and into the tail bag. I'm not saying it's not controversial. It's expensive, it doesn't always work, it's potentially dangerous, but it does save the life of a lot of sea turtles. And these are ex turtle excluder devices, so I want to introduce you to that. And this is a trawler. They just brought in their nets. The catch, which includes shrimp and lots of juvenile fish, too many juvenile fish, are dumped in here. Hopefully no turtles because the turtles have been ejected out through this turtle excluder device that prevents the turtle from going in the tail bag of the net. Of the net. So I, I hope that makes sense. Cape Lookout Point. I was with a bunch of uh, middle school students and I found a dead sea turtle. And there I am measuring it, which I normally do. And uh, this student I gave the data sheet to and I was calling out numbers to him. And one student said, I don't know if it's dead. And I said, oh yeah, it's dead. And they said, well, it's eye moved. And I said, what? Well, this turtle wasn't dead and that student was right and I was wrong. And this turtle was alive, but it sure looked and acted dead to me. So we picked it up, brought it to a dock, put it on a boat, transferred it to another dock, put it in a vehicle and sent it to the Karen Beasley Sea Turtle Hospital. And it was the biggest loggerhead at the time, the biggest sea turtle at the time they had ever handled. And they're on Topsail Island, or they were, now they've moved to another facility. And they rehabbed the turtle and called me to join the release a year later. Man, what a cool move that was. And I'm just so proud of their work. Um, and so this turtle was rehabbed at the hospital. And just a shout out to these good people uh, associated with the uh, Sea Turtle Hospital uh, Rescue Center on Topsail Island, uh, doing great work for people and sea turtles. Um, thank you, team. And uh, even before though, you proceed too far, wait, uh, Helen wanted me to make note of the fact that the Karen Beasley Sea Turtle Rescue and Rehabilitation Center is in Surf City and open for visitors Thursday through Saturday, one to four. Great to know. Yeah, now they have a stunning new facility. Uh, yes, and they, they invite the public and then please visit and support them uh, because they really are, are good collaborators and, and thank you, Helen. Uh, and they benefit from the sea turtle license plate. And they inspired me actually to get the dolphin license plate. Uh, but uh, in this presentation, I want to promote their plate because I'm just so proud of them and their work. So if you love sea turtles, consider putting this on their car and it helps sea turtles. Now, what is it? Those are bones that visitors bring into the museum that people find on beaches. And we get a lot of these and a lot of them I can't identify. Other people maybe can, um, but these are sea turtle bones unmistakably. And maybe some people watching have these bones and I really weren't sure. On the left is a rib with the attached dermal bone. And I'll show you where that is in an animal. Uh, and then on the left is a belly shell or plastron bone. Uh, uh, I'll show you right here, I think. So this is the carapace on the left and the plastron on the right. So carapace is top shell, plastron is the belly shell of a juvenile green sea turtle. And last night I was trying to figure out how to demonstrate where these bones go. 
So I held up the plastron in front of the setting sun. And you can see right through it and the outline of that pointy, strange, spiky bone inside the plastron. I hope that makes sense. That was cool. So I tried to do the same thing with the carapace. And there it is. So the ribs aren't inside the flesh of the turtle. They're actually outside, you know, in the shell under the scutes is the bone, the ribs. So you're looking at um, the inside of the shell and, and ribs on both sides and the spinal column, the vertebrae right down the center. I hope that makes sense. So those are the bones that people are finding. And I'm really excited because in Moorhead City, a terrific team assembled and just put on display the skeleton of a loggerhead sea turtle. And this is a lead, uh, Alexa, the lead student, uh, who, who brought this project to the finish line. So that's a loggerhead sea turtle that is currently um, on display and probably permanently on display at the uh, NC State Seamast facility on the uh, Com Carteret Community College campus. You can see it in the lobby there. And here's, <laughs> here's your final exam. <laughs> and, and sort of relates to Joe's comment about catching sea turtles. So the caption reads, diving for loggerhead turtle, Moorhead City, North Carolina. I forget where I got this. Um, maybe one of you know. Uh, so what's wrong with this picture? And I'll tell you, because you've already learned enough to know that that cannot possibly be a loggerhead sea turtle because it has the raised ridges on the shell. So unmistakably a leatherback, um, just technicality. But uh, it, you know, it demonstrates diving for a sea turtle. Why would someone do that? Probably not for fun, but for food. And, I, uh, and again, I've, I've read that uh, if you can capture a sea turtle, alive, presumably healthy, and you can store it on your boat and then and, and leave shore and have fresh meat when you want to slaughter, when you're ready to slaughter it. I used to work at SeaWorld. I confess this is a SeaWorld photo <laughs> of a loggerhead. They do eat blue crabs. Um, and then this one is about to eat a blue crab. And hopefully, if we can educate ourselves and the public and students, uh, this can be a sea turtle nesting beach for many, many turtle generations to come. And that is a nest that was laid the previous night. This is the first sea turtle I've ever, I ever saw. I was pretty sure it was dead. The top of the shell was dried. I was more interested in the mask booby that had perched on it. But as I brought the boat over, the booty flew away and the turtle dove, and I'm pretty sure it's a green sea turtle. I don't know what the relationship there was, but uh, first one I ever saw. And there you have it. So I hope uh, uh, some of you found this interesting and I enjoyed it. I hope it came through okay. If there are any other questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. I haven't seen any so far, but while we wait and give everyone a chance to type if they are, um, I do want to mention that um, for those of you that may have missed the beginning of this presentation, it is being recorded and within the next couple of days, it'll be posted on the museum's website, uh, ncmaritimemuseumsbeaufort.com under Museums at Home. You can see this presentation along with a number of other presentations from museum staff members. Uh, our next presentation will be on the 28th by Dave oh, Bennett. Oh, oh, sorry. That didn't um, sound like a turtle. Yeah, totally a turtle. <laughs> but otherwise, it looks like we have no new questions. So. Okay, I just want to bring your attention to the website at the bottom right of your screen, if you can, or the slide, uh, seaturtle.org. Uh, it, it's amazing, that website. I mean, results from nesting and hatching and tagging data research conservation uh, is, is all at seaturtle.org. I have nothing to do with it. They just do great work. So I bring your attention to that. And thanks for your interest and thanks for hosting, Christine. Nice to see you and everyone else. Thanks, Keith. Pleasure. Good to see you.